All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Persistence Playbook. And today we're joined by a TEDx speaker, an award-winning entrepreneur. He's actually a mental performance and leadership coach for celebrities, and he teaches audiences all over the world how to activate their Einstein. And today we're going to try and answer the question, how do we all tap into our unique genius and make our greatest positive impact on the world? Jason Goldberg, thanks for being with us, brother. Brett, thanks for having me, man. This is amazing. Like, I wish people would have seen what happened before we hit record. There was some really crazy stuff that we could have gotten canceled for. No, I'm kidding. No, it's, <laughs> it's so, so great to be with you, man. Love your energy and excited to have this conversation. Oh, me too, man. I'm just feeding off of your energy right now. Yeah. So basically, like, uh, Jason kicked the proverbial door open on the podcast studio room. I mean, he came in guns a blazing, a rocket on his back, ready to go. So I was like, let's just hit record. I don't want to waste any of this stuff. Let, let's just jump into this thing. Um, so, you know, let's talk just a little bit about your story first, you know, right? You, you spent 15 years in tech consulting. You co-founded multiple successful startups, including a partnership with NASA, which is pretty neat. Yeah. You know, somewhere along the line, you, you lost a hundred pounds, which is an incredible accomplishment in itself. Anyone, you know, who's ever tried a calorie deficit can, can attest to that. And, and now you're a sought after keynote speaker who's spoken on Mind Valley stages, TEDx stages, and, and many more. And, you know, I just are curious, you know, what message right now are you most passionate about teaching? Oh, that's a, that's a good, that's a great question. Man. I love that. There's so many things. I mean, it really boils down to, and it's funny what you said about how we kind of started the interview. It really boils down to my belief that you don't have to be serious to be successful. Like, I think there's, there's way too much emphasis put on seriousness and, and there's, there's a, there's a, a, a second side to this of what I focus on instead of seriousness. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have a plan. It doesn't mean you should be aimless and you should wander through life and hope for the best. But, but seriousness has become such a, an epidemic in this country where we're losing access to our creativity because we're putting so much pressure on ourselves to do everything, to do it right, to do it now. Everything has to be scale quickly, scale velocity. It's, everything is just so big. And we're losing touch with what actually makes us genius. We're losing touch with how we can be of service. We're losing touch with why we're doing what we're doing to begin with. And so if I can help anybody recognize that, just like I've had to recognize and have to continue to recognize, because I will take myself too seriously if, if I'm left my own devices, that the more we can actually release ourselves from this seriousness mm -hmm. trap, the more we can create. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with that. I think sometimes if you're, if you're taking yourself too seriously and your message even a little bit too seriously, it can, it can really stagnate your, your process. It, it, it can really kind of force you into this mode where you don't want to make a mistake because you're, you're, you're so in your own head about saying the right thing, putting the exact right message out there. And I, I remember that you said at some point that, you know, you've just got to create some crap before you can create the epic, right? So like you, you've just got to get in the habit of creating, create whatever it is, three, five pieces of content a week. The only way you're going to find your true voice is, is by using it. And I think some people just get so obsessed with finding that exact right message that they don't create anything. And they don't find that genius in the end. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm some people. I've been through that so many times. <laughs> where I, I haven't put the thing out because it's not perfect and it needs to continue being tweaked. And, and, and you know, my perfectionist tendencies come out and all this stuff. And so I have to keep my check, myself in check as well. And so what I typically uh, tell people that are afraid of kind of putting themselves out there and, and, and you know, putting things out in the world because they're afraid either people aren't going to like it or they're going to judge it or it's or that somebody's going to. This is the big one. People are, are so fearful of somebody saying you're wrong like posting something and then somebody in the comments saying, no, 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 that's not the truth. And it's like, oh my God, my entire life's over. And so the thing that I, I try to tell people is that it's not your only line in the play is kind of what I say. And what I mean by that is imagine you are an actor in a stage play and you have one line in this entire play, pivotal line. If you nail the line, your career is going to skyrocket. Everybody else in the play, their career is going to skyrocket. Everything's going to be amazing. But if you flub that line, you'll never work again. The entire play gets tanked. All the different newspapers say it's the worst play they've ever seen and everything falls apart. If that is what is set up for you in that play and you are standing off stage right, ready to come on stage to deliver that line, do you think you feel expansive and joyful and grounded and tapped in? Or do you feel like tense and like your butthole gets all puckered up and you like, <laughs> and everything just go, everything just goes terrible? And so, so and what I tell people is, is that sometimes we think it's our only line in the play, but think about if you were the star of the play and you have dialogue on every page of the play. If you come out and flub a line, 
it's going to sting, right? It's going to sting if you mess up a line, mm -hmm. but you have another line two seconds later and you're going to do that play three times a day, four days a week for the next six weeks. Nobody's going to care that you flubbed a line on day three in the afternoon session. And so the more we can realize there is no such thing as one shot, there is no such thing as a big break or a big make or a big break or a big failure. None of that stuff exists. If it was dictated by law, you had to create a thousand mediocre pieces of crap before the amazing stuff would come out, you would just get started creating the mediocre crap so you could get to the good stuff. It's so true. I love that. And the truth is we are the star of our own movie, right? And it's not our only line. We are the guy that the cameras are on for this entire experience. We never get to live life from someone else's vantage point. We only get to live it from our own. So I, I, I really think that's a, a powerful frame to kind of look at your life through. And there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, you, you talk to almost any successful creator or just any successful entrepreneur or business owner, they've all launched a lot of things that didn't work before they found that thing that actually hit. And it's, if you're just sitting there with your pen and your paper and you're journaling out business ideas and content ideas, but you're not actually taking action on anything, then you're really almost no closer to clarity than if you had not journaled or brainstormed at all. And the truth is the action is, is going to bring us to that clarity so much quicker. And by just creating that content, and maybe you don't know what your niche is. Maybe you don't know if you want to be a, a, you know, a mental health coach or a communications coach, or, or, or maybe you want to be a, a mindfulness thought leader. Just start creating content on all three. One of them is going to resonate with your audience. One of them is going to make you light up by learning and, and talking about it. And that's how you'll figure out what your, your pathway is. I think so many times people really just struggle on what's my niche? Who's my audience? I don't know what to do. And they wind up doing nothing when, you know, just start using your voice, you know, learn about things, teach things, and eventually something's going to stick. Yeah. And yeah, you're hundred percent right, man. I, I agree with that hundred percent. And, and there's, there's something else to be aware of here when we're thinking about like finding our thing or finding our niche mm -hmm. and, and when we're still kind of trying to find our voice. And I had this exact same thing when I started, my entire thing was, what am I going to be known for? Right. I look at all these people that I, you know, I look up to and all these other authors and speakers and coaches and like, they're known for something. What am I going to be known for? And then all the pressure starts coming in, right? I got to figure out this unique thing I'm going to be known for. And then I had this moment, it was after I'd written my book, Prison Break, and I was on a, I was on a press tour. So I was doing all these different morning interviews and like talk shows. And the very last one I was doing was a show called Good Day Sacramento in Sacramento, obviously. And uh, the guy that hosts, one of the co-hosts, the anchors who was interviewing me was a guy called Cody Stark. Amazing guy, no relation to Tony, but really cool dude. Great and name, so, great name. Great Co name. Cody Stark. That's a powerful name for, for broadcast television. <laughs> and the guy was so cool. He's such a nice guy. And some, some shows I had been on, you could tell they didn't even crack the book. Like one of the anchors on one of the other shows called my book jailbreak on the air instead of prison break, which is not <laughs> a big deal. It's fine. It's fine. But like, it just means he didn't even like look at the freaking cover of the book. Cody was different. <laughs> Cody, like he asked great questions. We had like fun together. He had done some kind of research or maybe somebody else did it for him. I don't care. He was present. He was really in it. Right. And after the interview was done, they went to commercial. AV people came over, they're taking the mic off and stuff. And I'm just sitting there kind of chatting with Cody. And Cody says to me, you know what, Jason, I don't know what it is, man, but like, I just feel more joyful when I'm around you. And he's like, my co-anchor said it. There were people in the green room that said it. The AV people were talking about it. Like, I just really want you to know that about yourself. And it wasn't the first time somebody had reflected like, oh, you're a very joyful, playful person, right? Sure. But it was the first time I realized, oh, wait a second. I've been so focused on being the smartest or having the best methodology or the most unique framework. And I'm missing this thing that actually impacts people. And so I started shifting my mindset from what am I going to be known for to what am I going to be known for activating in other people, right? What Love am I going to give them permission to feel? And so that became one of my kind of North stars for myself is that I want to leave everybody I meet with at least 5% more joy than when I found them. And so when I have that as kind of my foundation, Anything I put on top, whatever niche, whatever content, whatever, whatever angle, whatever it is, if it all comes from, I want people to experience more joy, then you can't get it wrong. What a great uh, business plan for life, right? Leave, leave, leave everyone you interact with 5% more joyful. Maybe it's your best friend. Maybe it's your dad. Maybe it's the barista, but just actively bring that energy, bring that joy into people's lives. I think that that's a really powerful frame that I think everyone should try going through their day at least once with. Yeah. And, and it may not be joy for you. And this is the thing, like, it's not something to, to pick and then force. It's not something you choose. It's something you uncover. Right. And so if you're not sure what that is for you right now, start asking people that you love and that love you and that you trust and have inter inter you know, interactions with you, deep interactions and say, what's different after you have a conversation with me? 
What's different in your world? And you'll hear people say, well, you know, I feel more inspired or I feel more peaceful or I feel more curious or I feel more fired up or I feel more like pissed off, like about what's going on in the world, like whatever that thing is, have that be your 5% and let that be your guiding star, your North star as you go out in the world and interact with people. I like that. What, what impact do you naturally have on the people around you? And then turn that up a little bit and That's really it. try and have that impact on everybody, even if it's just pissing people off talking about politics, you know, that, that, that's a powerful niche. <laughs> As we've seen, it's very yeah, powerful. A hundred percent. You know what actually I really like about that story is it, it really just, um, you know, illustrates the importance and, and the power of a genuine compliment. And, and that guy, Cody Stark, right. You know, brought it upon himself. He, he genuinely thought that, that you really brought joy into the room. And instead of just thinking that he said it yeah. and it kind of tweaked something in, in your mindset about yourself and about your message and about your impact. Mm -hmm. And that's just a reminder that our words and, and just giving someone some genuine praise, if we actually really feel it and think it in our hearts, can can honestly change the trajectory of someone's life by 1% in a positive way. So and, and and if we just go around giving three to five, you know, genuine compliments a day, I mean, people need that. We need praise about as much as we need air and as much as we need shelter. I mean, we need to feel that honest appreciation. And I feel like it's just something that people don't feel comfortable enough relaying to others. And it's, it's a habit that, that we need to kind of get a little uncomfortable and we need to get more comfortable giving those genuine compliments to each other. I so agree, man. I, I think you're right. I think you, you really hit on something that the world would be an entirely different place if we kind of prioritized reflecting to people what it is we see about them, even if it's something really little. Like I've seen some of these TikTok videos recently, which I really love. And I don't know if it's the same guy or if it's different guys, but I've seen these series of videos where somebody will walk up, younger guy, like something in his mid, late twenties or something, will walk up to like, you know, an elderly gentleman in, in the grocery store and be like, you are rocking that hat today, man. That looks so good on you. And this like 85 year old Asian guy is like, really? It's like, yeah, man, like it looks really good on you. He's like, I've never had anybody compliment me on the way I look. Like, the guy's 85 years old and nobody's ever complimented him. And you just made his entire life by telling him you liked his hat. So yeah, yeah. I, I totally think that little things like that go a long way. Yeah, they really they they, they really do. And um, you know, just to to kind of like, you know, switch gears a little bit and just kind of, you know, to talk about like, listen, of course you bring joy into people's lives. You're also a very successful uh, entrepreneur. And I, I one thing that you said that really kind of like resonated with me is that yes data is important we need to to leverage the data but we also need to leverage our own intuition and i'm just kind of curious like what does that look like in practice for you when you're weighing the data against your own intuition when you're deciding on where to drive your businesses yeah it's 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 a it's a great question man and it's one of my one of my friends and mentors from a long time ago used to say uh, follow your heart but take your head with you Right. And Love so it. it's, it's the, yeah, it's not an either or it's a, it's a both and. And so I, first of all, only want to listen to my intuition if I'm in a good mindset, right? I have to be in a good mind state. If I'm not, then when I ask myself questions about where I should go next, what sounds like intuition is usually fear, right? It's usually fear or scarcity sure. or me making a big deal out of something, making it too significant, trying to be perfect, all those things. So I first want to make sure that I'm in a good state because my intuition will never be unkind. It may be confronting, it may be direct, but it'll never be unkind. It'll never say, oh, you suck. Why would you even think about doing a business in that? Like, that's not intuition, that's, that's fear. And so I want to make sure that I'm in a good place kind of mentally first. And then I want to bring those things together. And so that's why it's so important to have your North Star. So when I talk about in, in activating your Einstein, when I give this talk, there's, there's three things that I, I tell people to do to create their North Star. And to me, the North Star is directly kind of aligned with your, your vision and, and, and your mission and, and, and your intuition as well. And so if you look at Einstein, Einstein actually didn't become a household name until 1919. And he had been doing his theory of relativity, which has nothing to do with dealing with crazy relatives at Thanksgiving, I heard recently. Uh, but, but he, he developed, <laughs> from, but he didn't become famous until 1919. So there was, there were a group of uh, British um, uh, scientists that went on these expeditions to study solar eclipses that were happening in 1919. And when they went and studied that, they basically proved that Einstein's theory was actually real. It was true, right? And that was when he just became the biggest thing in the world. And so they started interviewing him, of course, he's getting interviewed by all these different outlets. And in one of the interviews, he said something to the effect of, I would have been shocked if what my theory was, was not proven true. He's like, I, I had such a deep knowing that this was true, that if it had come out that it wasn't, I would have been completely floored. And, and what I learned from that was that he's essentially saying, you have to know yourself and you have to trust yourself. 
And if you know yourself and you trust yourself and you create a vision from that place, data comes in and data becomes an accessory to what you're doing, but data alone is not what makes your decision for you. And so it's really, really important to ask myself, how can I trust myself more? How can I know myself more? And then create my vision from there. And that vision will be a perfect mix between your intuition and your data. It's great stuff. That is great stuff. And that's pretty interesting too. I, I had no idea about all of that. That's yeah. a really interesting uh, story there. And it just kind of like, you know, talking about, you, so you have obviously, you know, found your voice in this space. You're speaking on stages, Mind Valley, TEDx, you know, so, so some of the biggest stages in the world as far as personal mm -hmm. development goes. What, what is your just kind of, because there's probably a lot of aspiring speakers that are listening right now, and they might be curious as to like what the nuts and bolts of, of your, you know, story looks like. How did you start your speaking career? How did you ascend to these stages that you're speaking on now? Yeah. Yeah, man, it was a lot of practice. It was a lot of, you know, speaking for free. I never personally went the Toastmasters route, but that's a mm -hmm. fantastic route for anybody who wants to get started. Mm -hmm. The thing is I went wherever I could, where education or speakers were needed, where they had no budget and yet they still wanted to provide value to some kind of audience. Cool. So whether that's like local associations, like rotary club type things, whatever it is, they're always looking for programming and they have zero budget. They don't have a penny to pay you. And so I of course, it. most speakers are like, well, I'm not doing that. I, I, I want to get paid. And I say, cool, that's, you know, there's a, a whole proverbial graveyard of speakers who didn't want to speak for free because it hurt their ego and their pride and they never became speakers. And right. I'm the opposite. I, I paid to go travel to places to speak before. I would jump on a plane, get a Southwest flight for 160 bucks and go fly somewhere and speak because I knew that audience was an audience that I would love to speak to and I could get Hell some yeah. content, some footage, all those things. So it's a lot of speaking for free. And there's in that speaking, there's a quote, it was actually a book by Cal Newport, but originally it was, a, it was a quote from Steve Martin, who is one of my favorite comedians of all time. And he has this quote where he says, be so good they can't ignore you, right? Be so good they can't ignore you. And that became my thing. So for example, let's say Mind Valley, for example, I actually attended one of Mind Valley's events called A-Fest. That's their big festival they do every year. I attended this back in 2015. And one of the things in my background is I also was a rapper. I was an actual like recording artist and, and did all this stuff. Nice. It was super fun. Open for Wu-Tang back in the day. And it was like, it was a thing I really loved doing. And I still Let's do this spoken word kind of stuff. But there was one night at one of the parties at A-Fest where the DJ was doing his thing. And I just said, hey, man, throw on an instrumental. I'm going to jump on the mic. And he's like, all right, cool. So he throws on an instrumental and I get on the mic and I start rapping. And all of a sudden, all these people are crowding around me. And Vision, who's the CEO of Mind Valley, walks into the party it's like, why is everybody crowding around this, this one person? What's going on? And he yeah. came over and saw what was happening. And for whatever reason, that experience for him was something that was so good he couldn't ignore it. And eventually that became a thing where I then came on to speak on their stages and then went forward to actually hosting their events live, becoming a teacher on their platform, all because I just showed up and gave my gift and wasn't worried about what people were going to think. I just said, I'm going to provide some value here. So whatever your thing is, my, my goal, anytime I do a live talk on a stage is that somebody in that audience should book me for another talk, right? Love it. Love so it. that's the core. Instead of worrying about crazy marketing techniques and all these clever things, just really show up, provide a ton of value, and people will want to continue working with you. That's amazing. I love that. Just put in the reps. You know, if, if you want to be a speaker, find places to speak. And at first, they're probably not going to pay you. And you might have to actually bring money out of your own pocket to, to get in front of people and relay your message. Mm -hmm. But like you said, there's a graveyard of speakers who probably aren't speaking anymore because they their ego got in the way and, and they wouldn't perform, you know, for free. I think that that is really, really inspiring stuff. And I'm curious, ha, did your message change a lot over the years? Like what was the original message that you were relaying in those early speeches at like the, the, the rotary clubs? Like what, what were you, pre what were you, what was Jason preaching back then? <laughs> it's, funny. it's funny, man. I feel like a lot of times my, I mean, maybe it's not that interesting, but to me it's, it's interesting is that my talks will morph with what I'm just curious about. And I'll notice, I'll know it's time to change when I'm no longer feeling a spark with the thing that I'm talking about, right? Okay. Like it's become so embodied in me. It doesn't mean I don't have to still work on the stuff. I have to still work on the stuff, but, but it's the, the message itself has become so embodied that I'm not as curious about that message anymore. And I sure. know it's time to switch. Right. And so, yes, it's changed a bunch. So in the very beginning, I was talking a lot about reinventing yourself. Cool. And that's because for me, I was trying to leave corporate and become an entrepreneur, right? And so sure. that, that was, I was very curious about how do you reinvent yourself? I've been in tech, you know, tech consulting 15 years. 
that's a lot of time and a lot of energy to spend in something. That's it's it's scary to leave that behind. And there's the whole sunk cost fallacy. You've done it for so long, you should just stick it out and keep doing it. And and so that became something that was really exciting to me. And so that was the very first message. And yes, it's totally morphed over time, just based on my own level of understanding, my own learning, and the things that I'm most curious about. I love it. I love it. And I, I think uh, you tapped on something there that's re really important is if you want to be a thought leader, you, you, you want to be an educator, you want to be a speaker at the core of all that is being a lifelong learner first. You know, if you're not consistently educating yourself, whether that be through books, podcasts, audiobooks, seminars, courses, whatever it is, if you're not consistently feeding yourself with new inspiring information, then you're not going to have a lot of value to, to bring to your customers, to, you know, to, to bring to your followers, to, to bring to your clients. And I'm just curious, like, what does your learning process look like? Are, are you trying to read a, a book per month? Are you more of a podcast guy? Do you take courses and seminars? Like what, what does your like intentional learning look like on like a, a yearly basis? Yeah, it's interesting, man. Like I, I read books, but I read them really slowly. And, and what I'll do sometimes that people think is, is kind of ridiculous is when I'm reading a book, and especially if it's something that's deeper into human psychology or spirituality or things like that, if I come across something that really has a profound effect on me, like I read that page and I'm like, whoa, okay, that's, yeah, I never would have ever put those two things together. Or I never would have thought of that. Or, oh my gosh, that's, I can see that playing out in my life. Like whatever that thing is, I will reread that page or those two or three pages every day for two weeks and just keep rereading just those pages. Because I think we're so quick to be in the achievement mentality of getting through all the books that when I hear people have read 52 books in a year, that's fantastic. But the retention and the application, where has that happened? And so I don't want to be in the, the world of information. I want to be in the world of transformation, right? And so for me, really zeroing in and just focusing on those two or three or four pages or chapter or whatever it is, and just going in on that over and over and over again until it feels like it's in my cells, that feels like it's a deeper experience of learning for me than just kind of completing a book or completing, you know, a, 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 an audio book or something like that. I do like podcasts for my, my walks. Uh, I, what I've, I've realized now is that I don't do well with psychology and spirituality podcasts on my walk. I have to really stick to business stuff on my walks. Okay. I think it's maybe because there's too much other stimulus. I'm, you know, walk, I'm crossing the road and I want to be careful and all that stuff. <laughs> so I, can't really like, I can't really like sit into and ground into the spiritual stuff. So sure. that, that I'll do once I'm home and I'm in the, the quiet grounded space of my house. Nice. I love that. And I think that is a really like powerful piece of advice. I, I like that a lot. You know, go deeper on the passages, the chapters, the books that really speak to you as opposed to just like crossing it off the list. Let, let's get to the next book and let's buzz through that one so we can say we read 52 books that year. When as really, we'd probably be better off if we just took the, the five to six books that spoke most powerfully to us in our lives and just, you know, read those again and yeah. again. And really dove deep on that knowledge, like you said, until you kind of internalize it and, and, and it's part of your part of your cells, as you said. I think that is really powerful stuff. I mean, it, if people just went through life and went back and forth between reading how to win friends and influence people and think and grow rich, they'd probably be fine. <laughs> You're so right. That's so true. Like there's so many things that are repeated in different ways. And, and it's actually funny that you said that because it hits on something to, to go back a little bit to people being afraid of putting things out in the world is, you know, anytime somebody says, oh, you know, who am I to be? writing this or why would anybody want to read this? I'll always say that to say to them, have you been to a bookstore recently? And they go, yeah. And I said, did you see the one book on parenting? <laughs> what do you mean? There's a freaking section of parenting books. So yeah, exactly. Because parents are still suffering. Right? Right. They're still trying to figure stuff out. So as long as people are suffering in any way, shape or form, you are doing a disservice by not sharing whatever it is that you know to be true for yourself. And so instead of trying to be revolutionary with what you create, I always ask people to be evolutionary with what they create. Look at what's been created. Look at what resonates with you and then ask yourself, how does that apply in my life? How might I do something different? How might I take this thing that I learned over here and this thing over here that has no connection to it whatsoever and find a connection? How do I look at my own stories of life and connect the dots between this information and a real thing that I went through? That's evolutionary and that's something nobody else can copy. And so in the exact same way, Think and Grow Rich, that book may not resonate with you, but the 5,000, 50,000 books that have been written since that are, have kind of the same information, but maybe have a different messenger to deliver the message may resonate with you more. Well, that book needed to be written because the first one didn't resonate with everybody. 
What, what, what a powerful kind of template and structure there to create content from. I like that a lot, you know, learn something and then, you know, put your own five degree turn on it, you know, add some of your own experience to it or add another unrelated piece of information to it and make it like an evolutionary blend of, of content as opposed to just learning something and then teaching the exact same thing. You know, that's, you know, so you're, you're, you're still brokering knowledge, but I think a more powerful way to do it is you've got to add a little something to it. Put your five degree spin on something you learned before you teach it to, to your, you know, to your people. Yeah. And, you know, just kind of like re really doing a deep dive into your, your, your content. You've got a really just a great blend of, you know, personal development, you know, in the clouds inspiration, but also kind of nuts and bolts in the dirt business strategy. And you kind of tie it all together with, with, with like a, a great, you know, just kind of natural comedic presence that, that you have. And, and I'm curious, like, what does your actual content like system look like? Are you jotting down ideas all day in a note? Or are you squaring off an hour a day to write content? How often do you shoot or, or create content? Like what does your system look like as far as content creation goes? Yeah, I'm a big swipe file guy. So the first thing you said about like taking notes, I have, and, I, and you know, this can be a challenge if you have swipe files everywhere. So I try to keep my swipe files fairly organized. But yeah, anytime I have an idea about anything, I write it out and it's not anything where I'm writing out paragraphs. Mm -hmm. I'll write out, uh, remember the conversation with Mike about, uh, you know, creating this event for his, uh, prospective customers. And it just remind me because I had a call this morning with one of my clients whose name is not Mike, but I changed it for, for this, for confidentiality. Love it. And, love and, it. Yeah. And we were talking about like how to bring more people into his business and he happens to serve two different communities, right? At the same time there, it's like up and down the supply chain, but mm -hmm. he, he serves two different communities. And so we were talking about this really fun idea to bring the two of them together to actually play on the rivalry in the same way like New York City Fire and New York City Police always kind of have a rivalry. And then they'll have, you know, obstacle courses and games and all this stuff to really act out the rivalry, but from a fun place. Sure. And so I'll just, jot, I literally, before we had this podcast, I literally jotted that note down in my, uh, in my swipe file. And I'll go back later and probably pr create some piece of content about creating community around your brand. How cool. How cool. So, so you're taking notes all the time on just different different content ideas are, are you blocking off time in your daily schedule to like actually go through those notes and, 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 you know, script the content or is it a little bit less organized? You just kind of do it when you're feeling creative. Like what does it look like in process? I, I go, I go through phases. And so, so one thing I've stayed pretty consistent on is that Monday I don't take calls unless it's a very, like if I'm about to go travel or be on vacation or something, I don't take calls on Mondays. Mondays is really for me partially cool. for admin, but, but a lot for create, for creation, for creativity. So like, you know, Mondays is when I write my newsletter that comes out on Tuesday kind of a thing. Right. And so Monday is a lot of the time reserved for that. Right now, I'm in a spot where I've literally just launched another business two weeks ago. And so that's going to require another level of content for me. And so I'm having to shift what I'm doing in my content and my coaching business and kind of putting more energy into the new business. And that's the beautiful thing about content. Like the thing that scares me, and, and I have a lot of friends who are, you know, influencers and they all hate the word as much as I do, but it's what other people call them. And, and they're, you know, creating content a lot. And there is a, there is a, 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 a large sense of, of pressure of to continually being on the content wheel, the content creation wheel, right? We got to keep creating content and you know, Gary, 100%. Vee, yeah, Gary Vee, who I freaking love. And I've learned so much from him. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, content, content, content. He also has a team of 50 people creating his content, right? It's like, it's a whole different thing here that Correct. solopreneurs and small business owners can't necessarily recreate. And so I was just talking to a client about this yesterday who has been, he went from zero to almost a full client roster in the last six months that we've working together. And a big part of that was him, him creating content and he's now feeling burned out on the content. And what I told him is like, listen, you've created the foundation with your content, right? If somebody finds you six months from now and they go check out your LinkedIn, they're going to be like, oh, wow, this guy's been around for a while. He's done some cool mm -hmm. stuff, right? You can get to a point with your content where you don't have to create content all the time. If you put out two really solid pieces of content per week and you're really engaging with the people who engage with you and that stuff lives somewhere, whether it's your Instagram or your LinkedIn or your TikTok or whatever it is, it's these little breadcrumbs of transformation that people will find now or tomorrow. The content you create today is not just for today. It's for today and for everybody else who's going to find it in the future. So you have to kind of feel that out for yourself. But once you get to a place where you kind of have a baseline where if somebody's never seen you, they can go spend an hour on your page and be like, I get this guy. I get what he's about. Like then, then you've done, you've done your work. And so if you're feeling like you need a little break from creating content, do not force yourself to do it because you're going to create crap anyways. And you look at people like, you know, Kendrick Lamar, who came out with this incredible freaking album that was just acclaimed all across the world. 
And as soon as he did that, the record label said, okay, cool. We need the next one in the next year. And he's like, it took me 30 years to do the first one. Why do you expect it to be happening again in one year? Right? <laughs> right, right. So just really taking stock of, listen, the business, know what business you're in. If you are a content creator for a living, then yes, you have to create content every day. 95% of the people who are probably listening to this create content as a supplement to their actual business. So really take a step back and say, what business am I in? And is there something that I could be doing that creates even more intimacy with the people that I want to serve than just creating content all the time? Yeah, I think that's a good way of thinking about it, right? Because a lot of people are not necessarily generating all their revenue directly through their content. Mo most aren't. It, it almost just acts as like a storefront for their business. So when someone meets you, they can Google search you and they can get to know you a little bit better because you've got some camera facing videos, you've got some blog posts, you know, some things out there. I agree. It just creates another layer of intimacy and trust with your potential customers. And if five posts a week is overwhelming, yeah, you can absolutely make an impact with one to two well thought out and valuable pieces of content per week. I, but I think it's the overwhelm of thinking, oh my God, I've got to put out seven videos this week that just paralyzes people. And that's why they don't put out anything for four months, right? Because they're like, well, if I can't do what Gary Vee says and put out 80 pieces of content across seven different platforms this week, I might as well not even try. When if you would just put out, yeah, one to two very well thought out valuable pieces of content per week, that would affect your business in a positive way. 100%. So... You're doing a lot of stuff right now, Jason, right? You, you are like a, you know, you, you're a speaker, TEDx, Mind Valley. You're, you're writing books. You're, you're launching n new companies. You're, you're on, you know, a different podcast a every day. So I, I got to know, like, how does a guy like you who is going after as many projects as he is? crazy ambitious as you are. How do you organize your days? Are you like a time blocker guy? Are you a to-do lister? Like what's your average day look like and what's your productivity system look like? Yeah, I, I'm a very, my fiance would, would laugh at this question. I'm, uh, I'm a very regimented, like I, I'm a system guy. So like I wake up pretty much same time every morning, even on the weekends, I'm usually like six, six thirty. maybe I'll sleep in all seven sometimes on the weekends, but usually a pretty early guy that I just, I wake up naturally that way. Now it, I didn't mm -hmm. used to, I was never a morning person and we could talk about how I became a morning person if that's helpful, but I, I wake up in the morning and I have my things. Like I have to meditate. I have to read my affirmations. I have to, you know, go to the gym. I have to do all these things in the morning to get my mindset right. And, and to me, it's, it's the analogy that I use is when a firefighter goes on shift, they check all the equipment in the firehouse because once the fire actually goes off and they need to leave, there's no time to check the equipment, right? And so my morning is the time I check my equipment so that when I go into battle, I am ready to go. Like whatever's going to happen, I'm ready to go. I so, love that. And, then, and then throughout the day, so I typically don't take calls until 10 a.m. I sometimes okay. I have called people in Eastern Europe and, or in Dubai. And so we have to do some, some shifting, but typically 10 a.m., which means it gives me that time in the morning to do what I need to do and, and get mm -hmm. prepped. And then I am. I am all about sacred calendaring. I call it sacred calendaring, meaning if it's not on my calendar, it doesn't exist. Okay. And so everything goes in the calendar. But at the same time, funny enough, and this may be extra work to some people, but to me, it's, um, it's more of a fulfillment thing. I'm sacred calendar, but I also have my to-do list at the same time. Like I literally on Sunday nights or Monday mornings, I'll go through my entire week of what's on my calendar and I'll put it as a bullet list on a note on my phone. And the reason I do that is because there's such a satisfaction of just checking the little button on the to-do list and inside of notes, thank you. And inside of notes, uh, <laughs> when you have the little, the little button set up there, when you hit it, it drops the thing down to the bottom, right? It goes to the bottom of the list. Sure. It feels yeah. great. It feels amazing. So what, what, I, yeah. I use those two things together. That that's my system to get everything done. Oh, that's pretty interesting. I've never heard like, uh, usually someone either is just a devout time blocker or they're a devout to-do lister. You've kind of combined the two. Whereas yes, you time block, uh, you know, by the hour you're putting what you want to accomplish, but you also have it in a to-do list because you like that sensation of checking that thing off the list, watching it drop to the bottom. What, what a shot of life for any productivity nerd or overachiever. They just love checking that box. And you're like, I don't, you're like, I don't want to give that up. I want both. I want the calendar and the time blocking and I want to check that list, baby. I think, I think there's probably something to that. I like that. <laughs> yeah, we we got to have small wins. Yeah. Right. And so like, honestly, if I, you know, like we're having this conversation and when we're done, the fact that I finished it on my calendar doesn't mm -hmm. give me any satisfaction. I mean, luckily this is a conversation, so I'm getting satisfaction from it. If it was like sure. an admin thing by myself, there's not a whole lot of satisfaction, but sure. just finishing something that's on my calendar gives me no satisfaction to then go over to the note and hit the button. It's like, oh, this is amazing. 
So, yeah, so right. I, I really, I really love doing that. And the other thing too, that I want to mention about the sacred calendar and two other things really quickly. Yeah. Number one is anytime I give my clients this assignment, it's one of the first things I do with people if they feel scattered or overwhelmed or whatever else, I don't give them a whole lot of context. I just say, let's have you time block or let's have you create up a sacred calendar. And they do it and they send me a screenshot and inevitably it is just a wall of colors of things. There is no white space whatsoever. Sure. Right? And so that's our first problem. Sacred calendaring does not mean you fill every minute of the day, right? Sacred calendaring has to give you time to adjust between things so you don't have a tension residue, right? If you want, if you want brownies to taste like onions without adding any ingredients whatsoever, just cut them with a knife that had just been used to cut an onion, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, you got you got to clean the knife in between, or that stuff comes over, right? So after this conversation, oh, I'm good. gonna need a, a little period to, right. to kind of reground myself, clean off the knife, so there's no yeah, problem anymore, right? And then go into the next thing. Yeah, get those Brett onions off of that knife, right? <laughs> but you know, but but before we jump into something else, dude, the Jason Goldberg analogies are just fire. They're just coming at me, I, left and right. I'm like. <laughs> It's unbelievable, and they're all just spot on, man. I mean, that is a, that is a, that is a gift to just be able to pull those out of your brain and throw them yeah, out there and, and into sure. conversation uh, on a whim. It's it's good stuff. But um, oh, can so I say I, one other thing on that? Can I say one other thing on the calendar? I, I was going to ask you more about the calendar because I think okay, it's fascinating. Cool. So yeah, so so say your one thing, and then maybe it'll answer my question. Perfect. So so the other objection people usually have to calendaring is that it feels too rigid. Mm -hmm. Right. I like to be in flow and you know, I get this a lot with my spiritual clients. I want to be, I just want to be in flow and I just want to open my third eye chakra and let my root divine. Pachamama <laughs> I love all those people and I'm, I'm like them sometimes. And so for people that don't like structure as much and they feel like it gets in the way of their flow, there is a way to bring those two things together. And, and what I mean by it is this. So for example, there's a coach I was working with who does not like structure whatsoever, just mm -hmm. it. And I, I always tell any clients that I work with, it really applies to most businesses, especially service-based or, or consulting kind of businesses. But there's typically three things that I want to focus on, right? There is, uh, there's content as much mm -hmm. as it works in your business, uh, connection, whether that means with current clients, prospective clients, or just connecting with people in general, and then client astonishment, right? Taking time to actually do something that just delights and, and pleases and just goes over the top of the people in your world. And so the thing that can be beautiful about this, so you can not have so much rigidity, is that you can create these buckets for yourself, whatever the buckets are. It can be creativity buckets, it can be administrative buckets, whatever it is in your world. And you make a list, a separate list, of all the things that could go in that bucket, so then when you sit down and it's 11 a.m. and you have an 11 a.m. two-hour creativity block, you don't have to force yourself to work on something specific. You go to that list and you say, okay, of all the 10 things I could work on creativity-wise, what feels good to me right now? Right. And so you, you have the structure of the time blocked, but mm -hmm. you have the flow and the flexibility of picking what goes into those time blocks based on a pre-written list that you always have available for you. Yeah. I like that a lot. You're like, okay, I know I'm going to be operating within this bucket for the next hour and a half, but I've got the autonomy, the power of choice to pick what feels right in this moment based on these tasks that I've put in this bucket earlier on. I think that that is actually really, really a, a smart way to go about it for people that don't look like to feel too confined by like an hour by hour schedule. And, and I can relate to that. Sometimes when I time block out my entire day, I just get halfway through it and it just feels like I'm like suffocating. I'm like, get this calendar off of me, man. I just want to go outside and frolic, you know, th through the meadows. So I, I, I think, I, I think I might actually give that a shot. Honestly, that's pretty good stuff. But, and uh, so you talked a little bit about the importance of kind of like giving yourself a little bit of time in, in between tasks. What are we talking here? Like 10, 15 minutes before you jump into a, like a new project or a, a new bucket? Yeah, it, it depends. A lot of times it depends on the, what's going to be required of me of the next thing. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I'm, if I'm let let's say I'm going to be reviewing something for a client, I can take 10 or 15 minutes after this podcast and then go in to do it. But if I'm about to go into a session where I'm like creating the structure for a new talk or a new course, then I may want to take like a half an hour, maybe even 45 minutes, maybe go on a walk, have a little bite to eat, get a, have a protein shake, whatever it is, maybe even a quick meditation, which is great. Just a little five minute, 10 minute reset meditation and then go in. So it kind of varies, okay. uh, but, but a lot of times it depends on what's next. Right. How much mental energy is this going to take? You know, I That's think right. that makes sense. It's almost like going to the gym, right? If you know you're about to hit the, you know, the, the squat rack for, for five sets, you might need a little bit more time but before you take that on. Right. Um, and I, I kind of want to stay on this, this topic because I really th think that you're spitting some fire right now in, 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 in the productivity space. Um, so 
Do you calendar out your day completely the day before? Is this something you do on Sunday where your entire week is more or less calendared out? Like, how does that work? I mean, I guess it, I guess it kind of happens naturally in that I have, and, and maybe this is something else to, to reference on my, on my little to-do list that I get all my satisfaction from checking off. Yeah. There's the kind of stuff that I'm doing normally throughout the week and whatever's sure. coming up for me in this week. But then there's like the bigger things that I want to work on that don't necessarily get a slot on the calendar because they're not with another person. Like, you know, mm -hmm. th this, we came here at a specified time. I wasn't going to come half an hour later and hope for the best. Right. We agreed right. That we were gonna come. But when it's something I'm working on on my own, that same constraint isn't there. Right. And so, so a lot of times I will look at what my calendar looks like for the week and then start plugging in those other things that I really want to get done. Sure. And even if I don't get them done, I at least gave some time and attention to them. Yeah. And this is another kind of like all or nothing mentality thing, which is kind of what we've been talking about with like, you know, creating content. Oh, it has to be perfect versus just putting stuff out there. I want to remember that the only thing that needs to happen with whatever it is I'm trying to be productive on is that it just deserves some time and attention. So if I'm sitting here saying, oh my God, this thing's not happening the way I want it to, have I given it enough time and attention? Oh, this thing, this thing went sideways. Had I given it enough time and attention for it not to go sideways? Like it's, it's a really simple, not always easy, but really simple equation. Are you giving time and attention to the thing that you're devoted to? And so I want to make sure that within all the things that are kind of set for me, podcast interviews, coaching calls, talks, whatever it is, I have the space there to put things in that really matter that are the bigger picture thing so I can give them the time and attention they deserve. Yeah. And that really is kind of the formula, right? For, for, for great work it is, it, you know, time times, you know, focus times action. And if you're, if you're sitting there and you say you're working on your, your online course, but you're really checking Instagram every five seconds, and then you're reading about your favorite football team on one tab, how much time and attention are you really given that online course? Yeah. And I, I think that kind of something you spoke about earlier on, you've actually spoken about it a, a couple of times is, is the power of meditation can really just help you as far as like prolonged focus on, on a new project that might be giving you a little bit of resistance. Mm -hmm. I think since I started meditating on a regular basis, I, I've just been uh, much more successful in focusing on new projects, sitting down for 30 to 50 minutes at a time and really getting dialed in. And I, I think it is just, an invaluable tool for anyone that is looking to do some deep work on, on a regular basis. And what does your meditation schedule look like? Are you like a morning meditator and then you throw in some mini meditations sometimes during the day? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. So I, I morning is, is non-negotiable and then the rest of the day it kind of it flows as it needs to. Sometimes it's just complete quiet and it's yeah, just complete quiet. Sometimes it's complete quiet and I'm having a conversation with the higher power, whatever you want to call it, whatever you want to connect to, it's, it's, it's up to you. Uh, sometimes it's a guided meditation. I have one particular visualization meditation that I do where I essentially have kind of like a 20 to 30 second uh, video clip in my head of something I want to experience in the future. And the one that I've been focusing on a lot is, is my, you know, my fiance and our future family that we're going to have and really being in the space of like seeing the kids, seeing the house, like, how are we feeling? How do I feel about myself? And, and what is it that must have happened to get me to this place? Right. So that's a very specific like visualization meditation. And then, you know, I, I love just finding new meditations on YouTube and just testing them out and seeing yeah. what they're all about and just, you know, just playing around. So I love all that stuff. The, the key here is that I think a lot of people don't meditate because they think the, 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 the outcome of meditation is meant to be a quiet mind. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you're supposed to have everything quiet. And then they sit for meditation for one minute, two minutes, five minutes. Like my mind was just going crazy the whole time. I failed. Right. So obviously I don't know how to meditate. And so I, I try to explain to people, there's two different ways you can look at meditation and it's recess versus nap time, right? Back when we were in school. Right. So nap time is lovely, right? It's the kids are all sleeping. Everything's quiet. But if you really think about it, nap time is so stressful for a teacher. They have to make sure the lighting is perfect. They got to make sure the temperature is perfect. They got to make sure Billy's not next to Tommy because he's going to elbow him in the face again. <laughs> and, then, and then when they wake up, you got to have the snacks ready and they may be cranky. And there's so much work to be done for nap time. But recess, on the other hand, the teacher takes the kids out into the yard. He or she sits on a bench. There's a fence. The kids run their heart out, have all the fun they need. And then they come back inside. But there's nothing for the teacher to do but just witness all of that going on. And so if we can take that on when we're meditating and saying, oh, my mind is racing and doing its thing, that's what the mind's job is. The job of the mind is to run. My only job is not to run after it. And Love so if that. I can just be in that space of just witnessing all the stuff, I still come out more relaxed as long as I'm not judging that experience when it happens. 
that's a really good way of looking at meditation because people really do struggle with that. I can't relax my mind when that's okay. Just watch the thinker, you know, totally. just kind of remove yourself a, a layer deep and just watch that thinker, watch where that mind goes and don't necessarily associate yourself with it. And that friggin' Billy dropping elbows on Jimmy in the middle of nap time. Like, well, what, what a, what a little jerk, man. I blame his father. I think it's a parenting <laughs> issue. I, you know, we've, we've had parent teacher conferences. He never shows up. It's a lot of cause. And one more thing you talked about with your morning routine that I think that you you said you did was was affirmations. And I'm curious what that looks like. Are you, are you affirming things that you want to happen in like a like a financial success sense, or are you affirming qualities in yourself that you'd like to see more of? Like, what what does that look like in process? <laughs> it's really funny. I, I don't I don't get to talk about this very much. Uh, so back in the day my affirmations, you know, look like I am healthy. I am wealthy. I, you know, all those things, affirming the things that you, you want to be sure. and living in that energy now, which is fantastic. It's great. And then I noticed that over time, something that I always do, something I'm a big proponent of is anytime I have an insight, whether it's an insight that just occurs to me or an insight from reading or whatever it is, something that really feels powerful. Kind of like when I would read those same pages over and over again in a book, I'll email them to myself. And I have an email folder that is very creatively named emails to myself. And, 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 and so I have all these insights in there. And so what I started realizing was that there were certain insights in that folder that I would always go back to. Like if I was stressed out or overwhelmed or, or down on myself or doubting myself, I'd go into that folder and inevitably I could pick something and be like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Oh man, that, I needed to hear that today. And so then what happened was I started creating kind of a document for myself, again, on my phone, just in my, my notes app, that started having some of those insights on them. And then I would start reading that every morning instead because like, well, these are insights that are powerful to get me into a good state. Why don't I just go back to these insights that obviously stuck with me? And then I'll be reading it and then something will occur to me as I'm reading it. I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm going to put this in here too. And so I added another thing in there. It literally now takes me, no lie, 15 minutes to read through this I entire thing every day because things just it. keep getting added to it and things will get removed also. So I'll go through it and I'll read something and I'll say, that doesn't, that doesn't resonate anymore. And either that means I, it's not important to me anymore, or it means it's not an issue anymore. And so I'll put sure. it away, but it has everything, man. It has everything from my North star and my goals about who I want to be as a, as a husband, as a father, as an entrepreneur, all that stuff. It has some monetary kind of financial uh, stuff in there just to keep me, keep me grounded in that. But the majority of it is reminders of things like, everything I do is my joy because everything I do is my choice. Because if I don't have that put in my face every morning, then I could say, oh, I got to do that. Oh, I have to do this thing. Oh man, do I really have to do that? And now I'm, I'm completely, I've given away all my power. I'm back into being a prisoner instead of being a self-leader, right? I have things on there such as uh, I have installed habits uh, or everything I do is a habit. And so I have installed habits that serve me. For example, I have a habit of staying level-headed and calm when things don't go my way. And I have a habit of being pulled by my big vision. And I have a habit of living from faith instead of fear and trust instead of terror. Like it's all these things that I just want to program my brain to remember. This is how we operate in the world, right? So it was less about the I am wealthy, I am this, I am that. And it was more like, how do I actually want to show up? And the very top of it says, wake up with this question every day. What will I create today? Right. What will I create today? And so I did that this morning and you were in my, what will I create today? Let's I go. Create, yeah. I will create an amazing conversation with Brett. I right? think we've done it there. Oh, I hope so. Right. <laughs> so, so that, 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 what will you create? I will create, I will create a, you know, a, a deep connection with my fiance over FaceTime who happens to be overseas right now. Like you can create anything. I want to create a deeper experience of a uh, relationship with my prospective clients. I want to create really grounded present time with my kid. Like what will you create? So when you wake up in the energy of what will I create? And then you have all these other things to remind you of who you are at your greatest so that you can create then you set yourself up for success for the day. So that's kind of what my morning affirmation practice looks like. That's excellent. And I really just think like guarding your mornings, making them sacred, you know, putting on your armor, so, so to speak, right? You know, I mean, the, the, the meditations, the, the affirmations, the morning workout, doing your best not to take calls until 10 a.m. because you really need to get yourself in that powerful state. It, it can be key in beating that resistance throughout the day when you get to 1, 2 p.m. And maybe you, you, you'd rather go, you know, take a walk or go play golf or something like that, as opposed to do what you know you need to do to make the impact you want to make. I think putting on that armor every morning can be key in, in beating that daily resistance. But I'm curious, do you ever get to that thing on your calendar at three o'clock and you're like, damn, I don't want to do it, man. And is there any like mantras or self-talk that you kind of leverage or lean on in, in those moments of 
laziness, procrastination, re resistance to, to get you to do the things that you know you should be doing to make the impact that you know you can make. Yeah, no, that, that never happens to me yesterday. Um, <laughs> So, so for me, the first thing is I have to look at the source of, of why I'm resistant to it, right? So there are some times where we're really tired and we need to rest, but we know the difference between I really need to rest and I'm procrastinating and not doing what needs to be done. So, so that's the first thing. I need to be clear where it comes from. Mm -hmm. If I'm resisting it, like you were saying earlier, I've set up this time to, to work on a course and now instead of doing that, I'm on Instagram and I'm, I'm reading about this and that. There's a really important thing that I want to share around that. Nike has screwed us up entirely as it relates to pro procrastination because their whole slogan is just do it, right? And, and the word most people focus on is do, right? You have to just do it, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the issue is, is if I was going to do it, I would have done it. Like that's, I already know I'm supposed to do it. That's, that, that's not helping. What actually is going on here is not that I don't need a strategy to be more effective or more productive. I don't need a strategy to get over the resistance. I need to realize that what's happening is that I'm putting too much significance on the thing that I'm creating, right? I'm making it into this big thing that if I don't do the course properly, it's going to fail. Or if I don't really get clear on what the message is, then I'm obviously an idiot and I'm not cut out for this. And so now, because this thing is such a big thing, it becomes the center of your entire universe and everything is staked upon that with your happiness and your safety and your security, then yeah, you may kind of be like, eh, maybe I'll do this later because if I screw it up, life's over. <laughs> and, so, and so I tell people, if you really want to be more productive in those moments, Look at the Nike slogan again, but shift your attention over to the word just, right? Because I just brushed my teeth this morning and I just logged into Riverside to talk to you. And I just texted my fiance, I love you before I came on this thing. I don't have rosary beads. I don't need to write I'm enough on my mirror. I don't need to do any of those things. I just do them. And so what if we could do the same thing with everything that we're doing? You know, I, I, I just come on here with you because it's Thursday and that's what we scheduled to do. I just do it. So if you can focus, get away from the significance of do and get into the playfulness and the levity and the, and the not so seriousness of just, it's a lot easier to get back into that flow. Powerful message, man. Jason, you brought it today and I appreciate you, brother. This was yeah. awesome. I appreciate what, you, man. What, where can people, you know, keep up with all you got going on and you got a lot going on. <laughs> a lot going on. Yeah, it's good stuff, man. Uh, so, uh, so my main spot that I hang out is Instagram. I am at the Jason Goldberg because Jason Goldberg was taken. So I got the most pretentious name I could, the Jason Goldberg. Uh, I but it. I promise I'm not, not that arrogant. I may change it to a Jason Goldberg just to be more relatable. Uh, so, so that's where you can find me on Instagram. And then I also just launched a brand new company a couple weeks ago. Uh, it is actually my first product. So it's a supplements for acid reflux. I've, I've suffered with acid reflux for the last 12 years. Uh, it's just been ridiculous. And all the stuff that you can take for it is really terrible for you and has long-term ramifications. So I've created a product called Kiss My Acid Goodbye. Let's go. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's just, uh, it's on pre-order right now, but you can go to Instagram for Kiss My Acid Goodbye and you can check that out there as well. Awesome stuff. I'm also the Brett McDermott. Brett McDermott what was taken and, and I, I, I screw that guy. Brett McDermott.com also taken. And the thing that kills me about that guy is he doesn't even have a website. It just reroutes to his LinkedIn page. I'm like, come on, man. If you're going to, if you're going to bogart the domain, at least make me a website. Come on. It doesn't even take, it's five bucks on Fiverr. Anyway, Jason, <laughs> thank you, brother. Everyone out there, this has been Persistence Playbook and we'll catch you on the next one.